What's up, peers, and welcome to the World Crypto Network uh, today for a very new show with a very new contributor here to the WCN. Uh, today, I want to introduce you uh, to Ricardo, uh, who has been doing uh, a couple of uh, really great articles, uh, and uh, he has been writing these articles on his personal blog, uh, CoinKH.net, uh, a blog focused on Bitcoin not shitcoins, reporting on the Bitcoin revolution from the front lines. Uh, and Ricardo really uh, has done a, a lot of good interviews with very uh, great Bitcoin projects. Uh, and he has uh, re recorded these interviews and then afterwards written up an article about them. And we have here, for example, uh, about the BTC Pay server um, with, uh, for example, here, Jeff Vander um, on uh, Vander, one contributor here to uh, BTC Pay, uh, or also with uh, Praflinex, uh, and also one here about Wasabi Wallet with Nopara, uh, and uh, other great articles here about Bitcoin anonymity and guides to the BTC Pay server. Um, and the cool thing is that he also reached out to me and asked to do an interview um, about BISC and the privacy best practices. Uh, and here uh, we have recorded already. He has done the write-up. And sooner or later, we're going to publish this here as well. Uh, so stay tuned. Absolutely. It was a great interview. And Ricardo really is a great host uh, and an awesome um, interview. He really condenses uh, great questions and pa packages them nicely. And this always leads to, uh, in my opinion, great answers uh, in all his articles. Uh, so stay tuned uh, for, of course, the further articles coming here on CoinCache uh, and especially the recordings uh, of these interviews being uploaded to the World Crypto Network as the uh, articles are being published. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, and today, uh, the first interview that uh, we're going to collaborate here on uh, with Ricardo Martinez is a interview with the BISC co-contributor, uh, Steve Jane, uh, who is uh, doing some awesome stuff here at the BISC DAO. And he is, uh, for example, working on the website or the documentation uh, and, and all the, let's say, yeah, the, the user interface stuff um, and, and support uh, and, and this. Uh, so definitely a, a job very much needed. And uh, he, is, uh, he really has a good understanding of the BISC DAO and uh, is a contributor to it and a participant in the DAO. Uh, so definitely worth uh, checking out. Uh, and again, of course, BISC, uh, we've done a bunch of interviews uh, or videos on the uh, World Crypto Network about BISC uh, and also one with Steve. Uh, so go back in the archives and uh, check the World Crypto Network uh, for all these uh, good uh, shows on the BISC network. But this one is particular about the BISC DAO. Uh, so how this decentralized exchange, your exchange, uh, actually uh, organizes itself. Uh, because of course, this is not an isolated individual. You're, of, of, you're, you are not an isolated individual hosting uh, this exchange. Uh, but you have, of course, other peers con joining you and contributing together uh, on exchanging here, on providing this marketplace, the Agora. And thus, a BISC DAO is just that. It's how the hell are we self-sovereign individuals going to play out here? And uh, what are going to be the rules? And how are we going to manage and organize these rules? Uh, and that is pretty much the BISC DAO. Uh, and I think it's a very novel approach. And of course, all uh, like very, very toxic Bitcoin maximalists <laughs> are then going to be like, oh, no, it's a DAO. It has a token. It's not Bitcoin. But I would say BISC is absolutely a Bitcoin exchange. Uh, it is a Bitcoin trading pair always. And it is first and foremost a cypherpunk exchange. This is for those that, do, that want to preserve their privacy and anonymity uh, and exchange without asking for permission and uh, as free and sovereign individuals should. Uh, thus, BISC absolutely uh, worth checking out. And the BISC DAO, again, is built on this same ethos. Uh, and uh, I very much uh, enjoy uh, it. Yeah contributing here to BISC uh, and this entire project. So definitely uh, stay tuned here. This, uh, I think, hour-long interview here, uh, well, we're, no, uh, 38 minutes, um, is very, very insightful uh, with great questions and even better answers. Uh, so stay tuned here for this interview with Ricardo Martinez and Steve Jane about the BISC DAO. Go uh, heads up, just so I can refer back to it later when I'm writing the article, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, cool. Um, if uh, you're ready to go, I'll start firing questions at you. Let's do it. All right. So first question that I have for you is, can you tell me what a DAO is? Um, I want my readers to get a good definition of a DAO before we start talking about it in depth. 
Yeah, that's a great question to start off with. Um, it's a it's a term that has a lot of misconceptions. I think people uh, kind of from the disasters in the past, people get kind of scared, and there's a lot of a lot of, a lot of baggage with the term. Um, but the term DAO, just in general, uh, decentralized autonomous organization, um, it's just a mechanism to control the operations of a project. Um, just like you would pick a company or a corporation for you know the limited liability and the joint stock and the you know ability to invest. Um, those are all great attributes of companies, but it also means that you need to register with the state. And so there's a very important legal component to to having a company. But with the DAO, everything's managed by software. You have the you know some kind of a mechanism to handle um, decision making and funding. But instead of that structure being sanctioned by the state, it's sanctioned by software. So there is no state involvement. And in the case of BISC, it's an important point of uh, of control that that's removed. Okay. Awesome. So that's how I think about it. Perfect. Yeah. Um, can you explain how BISC is different than like a regular cryptocurrency exchange? Yeah. Um, so there are a couple of ways. I think the first, uh, in the first way, it's so it's decentralized, obviously. So in, you know, in the traditional sense of of what they call dexes. So that means that you you maintain custody of your funds. You always have control of your funds. Um, in the case of BISC, uh, kind of like hold or hold, uh, trades are peer to peer. So there is no central order book or order matching. So that's how BISC is similar uh, to other decentralized exchanges um, and, of course, also different from traditional exchanges, um, but it's different from all the others in, in, a, in a couple of key ways. Um, as you're probably aware, it's software that you download, so there is no website that you visit to actually facilitate your trades. Um, the whole stack is open source and verifiable as a result. Um, there is, you know, because there is no website, there is no server that you have to trust. You download the software, you can verify it, you can inspect it, and and run it on your own machine and know exactly what's going on in every part of the process. And um, yeah, I mean, the privacy is a top priority. So the whole network, the whole BISC peer-to-peer -peer network, runs on top of Tor. Um, we have no idea who our users are, where they are, or anything like that. Um, so that's another key point. And the last point, uh, which I'm sure we'll talk more about, is uh, is governance. All right. So BISC is it's software that's not really owned by anybody, but it's also software that's not controlled by anybody. And uh, that's a very very important point that I think a lot of other exchanges miss. Um, you know, regulation and and, and there are going to be a lot of pressures, I guess, um, from various actors, from the state and otherwise. And being able to handle the, that pressure and those those influences, uh, governance plays a very, very key part in that. Excellent. Um, okay, so why is the DAO model uh, so powerful for an application like BISC? Yes, that's a, actually a perfect segue for, for what I was just saying. So, um, I mean, exchanges are a primary focus for regulation, right? It's one of those, uh, the few places that regulators can actually re exert control in the Bitcoin space. Um, and, you know, we've seen examples of this just in the past several months, right? So Shapeshift, Ether Delta, um, even local Bitcoins, CryptoBridge, IDEX, these are all platforms, exchanges that, that had to either go under or flip to KYC because, um, not because they were technically deficient. Their software and their websites and everything they were running, I mean, they, they were working just fine. They flipped because their governance model left them with no other choice. And so that's why that's the heart of why the DAO model is so powerful for BISC, is that because it's decentralized, uh, it's, its control is decentralized, it doesn't necessarily have to worry about uh, uh, handling pressure uh, from regulators like these other exchanges had to, you know, had to eventually cave to. Okay, I see. That, that is um, really important. Um, so how does the DAO... Um, differ from the current open source project setup that BISC has right now? Yeah, so I think right now BISC is more or less structured like your typical open source project with a couple of couple of key exceptions, but for the most part you can think about it like it's software that's, you know, it's, it's um, 
it's it's uh, development is is tracked and handled on GitHub. Uh, people speak, uh, discuss, and collaborate on Slack, um, and people are largely contributing to the project because they want to. And so it's something people are doing in their free time as they can. Um, but the DAO will will change that in in two big ways. Well, one big way, I guess. Um, Okay, so the, the DAO has two primary purposes. It is uh, to decentralize funding and to decentralize decision making. Um, decision making is largely implemented right now with GitHub issues. So um, when someone has a proposal to change the way some, some part of this works, they'll make a proposal and the whole community, traders and contributors, can put in their input and um, and kind of uh, participate in the strategy making uh, of the BISC project. Um, now, of course, GitHub is still a website, so that's kind of a centralized point of control. Um, but as far as the collaborative, decentralized decision making aspect of the DAO goes, it's kind of already practically in place. Um, where the DAO will really differentiate BISC it, from regular open source projects is in is in funding. Um, so what it's going to enable is for trading fees to be distributed from traders to contributors directly without any central wallets or any central points of control. And that's not the case right now with the project. Um, as all fees go to hard-coded wallet addresses that are owned by BISC arbitrators and other contributors are not paid anything. So with the DAO, all contributors will be paid um, which is, you know, right there, a pretty big um, uh, difference from most open source projects where people aren't paid at all. Um, and not only will they be paid, but they'll be paid um, without any central gatekeepers. Awesome. Um, what is the BSQ token? Ah, in one word, I would say it's a placeholder. You can think of it like an IOU. There's a lot of... Uh, I think misconceptions around this term, token is kind of uh, a hot button kind of term, uh, at least it has been, I think, become that way in the past couple of years. Um, the BSQ token achieves something that plain Bitcoin simply cannot achieve. Um, in short, it's a way for a BISC contributor to be paid for their work when the supplier, when the payer of a Bitcoin is not known. Okay, so the general process, um, goes like this. So a contributor does work. Maybe they write a doc or they do an interview like this or they do, um, I don't know, they, they develop a feature or whatever it is. They contribute some value to the BISC network. And the community of BISC users and contributors approves their contribution. They vote and agree on, you know, whatever the contributor did is actually worthwhile. The contributor is then issued BSQ. Once they have BSQ, contributor sells that BSQ to traders for real Bitcoin. And then, of course, the trader uses that BSQ that they bought to pay trading fees on the BISC software. Um, we can talk more about how, you know, the details of how all this works, but the key point here is that this dynamic cannot be achieved with plain Bitcoin because, well, for a couple of reasons, but the most major one is that traders are not around to pay contributors with Bitcoin at the exact time that they earn it. So at the end of this month, you know, let's say March 30th or March 31st, I put in a compensation request for um, a thousand BSQ for the work that I did this month. Um, there won't necessarily be a trader with a thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin to pay me for my work at that particular instant. And so what happens is I get BSQ as a placeholder for the value that I've earned. And then over time, traders will pay me Bitcoin for that BSQ as they use BISC. Um, and I get compensated in that way. Okay, awesome. Um, how is like the diehard Bitcoin maximalist community reacted to the BSQ token? It certainly changed. So it's a it's definitely a, a point of drama. I mean, uh, at first it was kind of uh, a little shaky. That you had a lot of maximalists kind of like a token, and they just go crazy. I can't believe Bisk is doing this. You know, Bisk has been around for. Five years. I mean, it's going to be three years that it's been in operation in April. It's almost three years, and it was in development for two years before that. So it's a five-year-old project. It's been in the community for a while. 
Um, people know about it, and I think largely people. I'm gonna I'm gonna hazard a guess here and say that people largely I think realize that BISC has always been uh, has always kind of operated in the best interest of Bitcoin and and its users. And so when they people hear token, they're kind of like, oh my god, they freak out. Um, but lately, I have to say, in the past four or five weeks, um, I think people are kind of realizing that. You know, from the examples that I quoted earlier of all these other exchanges that had to flip to KYC, um, people are really realizing how critical governance really is, and that new models need are needed. And you know, very obvious example is Bitcoin itself. Nobody controls it, and because of that, it's it's able to do things that nothing else can, and it's it's very resistant to pressure in that way. So um, you know, I've seen, like I said, I've seen sentiment change uh, on Twitter. Uh, in particular, where a lot of maximalists hang out. I've also seen on Reddit, I posted a thread uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it was a post titled the, Bi the Bisque DAO for Bitcoin maximalists. And it was targeted especially at maximalists to cover all the objections that they had. And um, it got really, really good reception. People, I think it was on the front page for like a day. And um, uh, I think that subreddit is also kind of maximalist heavy. So I think... Um, you know, lots of positive reactions, and uh, yeah, overall, it's been very encouraging. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I actually read that post in in that uh, subreddit. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, is the BISDAO going to issue other tokens or just BSQ? To be honest with you, I don't think anybody really wanted even wanted BSQ. <laughs> okay. I mean, the token is really just something that we, it was really like the least worst solution. It was the only thing that was able to, I think, meet the constraints of the particular challenge. Um, I mean, there, there are other approaches you could possibly use, like, uh, for example, multi-sig wallets are, are often proposed as an alternative, but um, there's just too many limitations and they, they just, you can't do what we're trying to do with, uh, with that approach or any other approach. So. Um, no, I, I don't think any other token is 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 is, is even uh, remotely a possibility, okay. in my in my opinion, <laughs> from what oh, I know. Awesome, um, I had to ask. Um, what's the overall response yeah. that Bisc has been receiving about in terms of the DAO? Like, are people supportive or? Yeah, I mean, like I said, I think I think sentiment has changed a lot. I mean, I think people, like I said, are, are, are realizing that uh, that governance needs to be considered. Uh, probably first as a priority in terms of uh, in terms of running an exchange. Um, it's you know building an exchange from a technical perspective is largely a solved problem. I mean it's it's uh, you know we know how to write the code to make a functioning exchange. What we don't know how to do is control that exchange so that it safeguards user privacy and um, uh, you know, user rights as as much as possible. That's something we need to figure out. That's not a solved problem, and I think people realize that with the uh, with recent events. Okay, awesome. That actually um, leads right into my next question, which is, how does the BISC platform and BISC DAO help a privacy conscious Bitcoiner uh, stay private? Yeah, well, it's it's software that you download and run. Like I mentioned, it's uh, it runs over Tor, so nobody knows your IP address. There are no accounts, so you know no information that you have to disclose in order to use BISC. You literally just download it, you run it, and you can just start using it instantly. Um, there's no way really for anyone to know who you are, what you're doing, where you are, uh, except for the person that you're trading with. So, and you know, there's very various aspects of of the way BISC has been built to mirror Bitcoin itself. And so, um, you know, I like to think of it as the the most, uh, um, just philosophically the most uh, most aligned with uh, Bitcoin itself. It's just, uh, I think, a very elegant, elegant model. Okay, awesome. Um, does the BIS DAO pose the same kind of risk to users like we saw with Ethereum's DAO, which was famously hacked? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I don't think so. I honestly don't know a whole lot about the technical workings of the Ethereum DAO. Um, but on the BIS DAO, I can say that, that coins are 
So the BSQ tokens are colored Bitcoin and they're stored in local wallets. So hacking would need, would at least on the user side, would need to occur on a device level, which, you know, it's, it's quite, uh, I think, kind of a far-fetched thing. Um, but the other big attack factor that is probably more concerning is uh, rogue issuance. So the idea that somebody will find a way to issue themselves a huge amount of BSQ um, that they don't really deserve. Um, obviously, this is kind of a big point of, um, of focus for the developers to make sure that there are enough checks and balances, checks and protections in place to make sure that um, that this doesn't happen. Um, but anything ultimately could happen. And so um, the developer team has established that any issues that, um, that do take place um, will follow the principle of what you can think of as code is not law. So that if things do go wrong, every effort will be made to fix them. Um, this was a kind of a big uh, controversy when the Ethereum DAO blew up, was that you know, Ethereum is meant to be a protocol. And so it, you know, changing the code to deal with an attack was kind of a big deal. Um, but the distinction here is that the BISC DAO is not a protocol. It's not a protocol like Bitcoin is. It's not a protocol like Ethereum is meant to be. And so, um, you know, what it really is is a mechanism to govern the human activity on the BIS network. So if there are issues, which, you know, we don't expect, but if there are issues, then they'll be dealt with accordingly and, um, and handled, um, you know, in, in, in whatever way is, is necessary. Okay, great. Um... Will the DAO be able to scale with the growth of the platform? Like, if it starts getting, if BISC starts getting the kind of volume that we see on um, some of the larger exchanges, will the DAO be able to maintain? Yeah. Um, well, so there, I think there's two parts to this. So there's there's the BISC trading network, and then there's the BISC DAO. So the trading network is peer to peer, and um, I mean, we we've seen spikes of five, six x at the end of 2018. Um, in, in trading volume, and the network was just fine. Um, so on the trading side, I think we'll be fine. Um, you know, of course, we have a long ways to go to meet volume uh, uh, numbers of, of some of the bigger exchanges, but it, it's a distributed network. So I think, um, you know, it, it should be fairly well built to handle more volume. In, in many ways, it's actually better to have um, more volume. Um, as volume grows, and a distributed, distributed network should be should I think become stronger? Um, on the DAO side, there there are practical limits to the amount of scaling that can actually happen. Um, proposals, voting, all these DAO functions happen on chain, and um, you know that has obvious limitations. But practically, we don't really ever see there being more than probably forty to fifty active contributors, um, and then. You know, at that level, probably no more than a couple dozen proposals in a single voting cycle. And so from that standpoint, the DAO itself doesn't really have to scale that much. And I mean, I, I'm sure we're going to have growing pains and we're going to have issues that we're going to have to deal with, especially as transaction fees and the Bitcoin price goes up. But I think, you know, I think those will be um, things that we can deal with uh, as they as they occur. Awesome. Um, how have the contributors to BISC? Um, reacted to the DAO? Uh, well, I, I think they're quite excited. They'll finally be able to get paid. <laughs> so I think uh, it's certainly something they're looking forward to. And uh, yeah, we're, we're just counting down the days. I think we're, we're targeting a, uh, if all goes well, probably second or third, uh, yeah, second or third week of April for the launch. So awesome. Definitely looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. Um, are there, or what's the long-term vision from the BIS team for, for the BIS now? Yeah, well, first we'd like to see it work with BISC first. I think that's a, that's a big first step. Okay. Um, but yeah, assuming it works well, I mean, um, further looking further down the line, I think we'd love to see it become the inspiration for, for more uh, responsible, transparent, and a collaborative software, which which doesn't betray users. Um, you know, there's you uh, probably lots of examples you can think of which which don't have that. You know, social networks, even operating systems, 
where um, users are kind of bait and switched. They sign up and then they think one thing and then something else happens with their data and their privacy and it's just not a good situation. Um, so, you know, we're hoping to see new software which uses model which um, where development and strategy is, is reinforced with feedback and, and payments from users who, who most value it. Um, you know, it's, it's just, it's, it's really, I think, realigning incentives between developers and users. Um, users really shouldn't have to be slaves to, you know, some small developer team somewhere on behalf of investors. And I think uh, the models, the model we've proposed with the BISC DAO really realigns incentives to make everything more fair. And the other thing I want to say, I guess, is from the contributor side, it's, it's a very interesting concept as well. Um, you know, contributing to BISC is, is, it's up to you. It's totally, there's no gatekeepers, nobody to tell you um, whether you can or can't contribute. And so economically, it's kind of an interesting, interesting concept because it's a means for anybody to work at will. If you can, uh, if you can contribute high quality work that improves the service, then you'll get paid for it. So there are no artificial barriers like hiring or interviews or uh, complexity with regards to salary level and fairness and what we call equal opportunity here in the US. There's none of that craziness. It's just straight, do the work, get paid for it. Um, and uh, I think that's a, a, a dynamic that I, I don't think is, is very prevalent anywhere else. Um, you know, um, And it, just an inter interesting tidbit, I think, is that um, it, it's so it's so permissionless and so hands-off that there are there's actually some people, I've been working, contributing to the project now for almost a year. There are some people who've been contributing to this project that I have no idea who they are. Like, I, I never see them on calls. I, I don't know what their name is. I don't know where they live. No idea how to contact them um, aside from Slack or GitHub. But um, they, they do work every month. They add value to the project, and they're paid for it. And, um, you know, they, they could be... You know, people uh, banned by banks. They could be people who governments don't like. They could be anybody, but they're able to uh, have a means to be economically viable through BISC, which I think is a quite a fascinating thing. Yeah, that's awesome. I could actually see a bunch of open source projects implementing something like this if, if it becomes successful. Yeah, I think I think I actually wrote a post about this a couple of days ago. I think a part of the part of the the reason it hasn't been uh, viable so far is just that um, it, it hasn't been feasible for users to pay just practically. Like, how do you pay someone for software that you're using? Um, BISC has kind of gotten around this prob problem by um, by having a means to pay weaved into the natural uh, flow of using the software. So when you make a trade, you're already kind of opening your wallet to pay money. A little bit of that goes to towards funding the BISC project. Um, you know, most most software doesn't have that benefit. There's no real natural way to pay developers from the flow natural flow of the software. Um, but hopefully, you know, Bitcoin being a natural, uh, digitally native currency, um, hopefully that'll change some things and 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 uh, open some um, paths to making software financially sustainable from right within the software. Okay. Um, are there other projects doing stuff like this, or is BISC like pretty much pioneering a, a new path? I'm not aware. So I think th there are definitely other DAOs. So Dash has a DAO. I think I believe Dash is a cryptocurrency that that uses a DAO model to fund its own development. Um, there's the Moloch DAO in the Ethereum space, uh, which I believe uses uh, a DAO model to uh, collect funds for investing, um, but both examples are very different, right? So one is a cryptocurrency, the other one is an investment uh, investment allocation platform. Um, BISC's DAO is designed to fulfill the needs of operating a business, so to speak, and so there's a different set of complexities and I think it's uh, the only one I know that's trying to tackle something like this. Okay, cool. Um, how can someone get involved as a contributor to BISC or the BISC DAO? Uh, well, it's kind of like uh, any other open source project. I mean, you just kind of um, 
observe the project. It's usually best to observe the project, uh, look at the GitHub, uh, you know, get in the Slack and kind of see what people are talking about, where uh, value can be added, uh, specifically what, what can be done or what needs to be done, um, either on the development side or on the marketing side. Uh, if you want to um, spread the word about this, increase liquidity, whatever it is that you want to do, um, just kind of get an idea of what needs to be done and, uh, you know, get to know some of the people in the project and um, float your ideas, see if what you want to do is something that people would consider valuable. And then um, once you get some uh, some uh, some approval, just kind of do it. And, um, you know, once you do a few things, you'll kind of get the hang of how the project works. You'll get some feedback. And then, you know, if you're interested, you can always do uh, bigger and bigger contributions. And that's kind of, uh, that's, that's my story. I mean, I started doing just little documentation uh, projects here and there. And um, this, that eventually just kind of snowballed into, you know, a bigger, bigger role and, communications and uh and and marketing awesome um what kind of skill sets is bisque looking for is it only people that can code or can people help in other ways oh no i mean we're we, we we'd always love to have more developers for sure um but i mean bisque is a flourishing project that can use people from really any background so um you know, if you're a marketer, if you have a background in communications, if you're a good writer, if you're a designer, um, these are all skills that 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 this could could very much use. Um, you know, like I mentioned, I, I don't have it. Well, I didn't mention this, but I have a background in software development, but I actually don't do any development for BISC itself. I do mainly writing and communications and a little bit of web work design. Um, so, yeah, it's it's really open ended. We. Uh, if anything, actually, we could probably use more like non-developers because we have a lot of developers, and when it, when it comes to marketing and, and and growing liquidity, we're kind of at a loss because we don't have too many people who um, who know that side of things, who are, who think in a marketing-oriented way, and so uh, we could certainly we could certainly use that kind of help. But yeah, anything. If you like, basically, what I would say is if you if you if you're interested in the project, you like what's going on, you like what the the mission, the philosophy of the project really highly encourage you to check out the GitHub and Slack and just kind of um, uh, just, you know, get involved as you uh, as you can. Awesome. Um, how do you think the DAO and BISC will do in terms of competing with um, custodial exchange businesses? Um, I think I think people I think people are seeing the issues. So like, you know, there's there's news, it seems like almost every week about something bad about Coinbase. Um, and I think people are, you know, this has been happening for years now, but, you know, recently the delete Coinbase, uh, you could say movement gained a lot of traction. I think people are realizing that centralized custodial exchanges are in many ways just reincarnations of traditional banks. They're blindly doing the bidding of the state whether it makes any sense or not. And that's really antithetical to the whole point of Bitcoin itself. I mean, you already see strong opposition to companies like Coinbase. Um, and I think that's only going to continue. Awesome. Um, is the DAO going to use the trading fees or BSQ to um, pay for like advertising and other traditional business expenses like a normal custodial exchange would? Yeah, well, I mean, indirectly, I mean, uh, the, the fees, BSQ fees don't go to any central place. Um, BISC, as, as most people, th people think about it, doesn't really exist. Um, but we do hope that contributors uh, will contribute to such activities, you know, that contributors will do advertising and marketing and everything needed uh, to, uh, you know, that a traditional business would typically do. Um, and then they will be, they'll be paid in BSQ for that work. So okay. I guess the answer to your question is yes, but not in the traditional, uh, you know, capital allocation toward advertising and marketing. It's more that contributors will take the initiative to do those jobs and then they'll be paid for it with uh, BSQ afterward. Okay, awesome. Um, how do you think the Dow is going to hold up yep. in the spotlight of financial regulators and, and regulatory oversight? Uh, very well, we hope. Um, I mean, that's part of the reason we have the DAO. Um, 
I will say that I don't think that using Bisc is any different from, say, you and me doing a deal in a coffee shop. I mean, it's just two people, you know, meeting to do a deal. You, know, you have Bitcoin, I have dollars, and I pay you for the Bitcoin. It's, it's, it's really the same. It's, it's nothing. It's not any different. Um, Bisc just makes it electronic and, you know, uh, takes the, the borders out of the situation. But um, I also want to mention that regulation does actually serve a fine purpose. Like, we want to keep this user safe, too. And that's, you know, I think often what regulation aims to do. Um, but we just do it through a very um, intentional set of, of, of incentives. So, I mean, so far, I mean, we, BISC just hit 25,000 trades like today, I think. Um, in the past three years, it's been live. There have only been three chargebacks. Three, three chargebacks in over 25,000 trades. Wow. So, you know, you have folks, yeah, I mean, you have folks, they, they maintain custody of their funds. So they're not entrusting anybody to, to, you know, to hold their funds for them. They don't have to contribute their data to any central honeypot. Um, and we've taken great care to make sure that, that the financial, the payment methods that are, that are offered in BISC are, are safe and to the point where we have this, you know, almost inconsequential number of chargebacks in, in the three years that the software has been around. So, um, you know, I think smart incentives is a big part of, um, of, of what BISC has, uh, uh, you know, put in place to, to fulfill the same, um, you know, job of, of regulatory oversight. Um, so, wow. yeah. So in all those trades, 25,000 trades, you've only had three, those are like the only three incidents in which an arbitrator was needed? Oh, no, no. So three chargebacks in the sense that um, those are the only times that uh, a chargeback has happened. Arbitrators are, I mean, I would say they're still rare that, that a trade needs to be disputed by an arbitrator. Um, but uh, so I think it's like, I don't know the exact numbers, but probably like, I don't know, like 80 or 90% of trades go just fine. And then a small percentage of them have to be arbitrated. Um, but for most trades that have to be arbitrated, it's usually something small or stupid. Like the person forgot to make a payment uh, in time. So they were like an hour late in making the payment, or maybe they forgot to hit the button in the BISC program once they made a payment. So they forgot to acknowledge that they made the payment. It's something small where like the intentions were fine. Uh, there was no like fraudulent intention. It was just some like really minor, uh, you know, issue that's uh, easily resolved. Um, so yeah, it's not that, I mean, there's definitely been more than three arbitrations, but uh, in terms of chargebacks, people actually losing money, it's only happened three times. Wow, that's amazing. That, that's really, really mind blowing. Um, is there yeah. anything else about BISC or the BISC DAO that we haven't covered that um, you want my readers to know? Um, I, I would just say I would urge people to consider what we're trying to do, like what we're trying to accomplish with the BISC DAO. Um, you know, it's, I, I know the terms DAO and token are kind of scary to a lot of Bitcoin people, and perhaps they're not the best, <laughs> not the best terms. Maybe we could have picked different words, but, um, you know, I've been contributing to the project now for almost a year, and I've yet to see BISC do anything that's hostile to Bitcoin or hostile to users. Um, and I think a lot of people realize that. Um, so I would just like, you know, it's urge people to take that into account. You know, we're not like, we're not nobodies. Um, been around for a while and I think been doing pretty good for the for the community. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, because of all these other efforts that have been hostile, it's easy to dismiss what we're doing as a scam. Um, but I, I did actually make a video series that explains everything very clearly and about like in short three to five minute videos. So uh, I just highly recommend people to, to check those out. I can send you a link. Yeah, please do because I want to include those in the article. Like. I'd like to link people to, to your videos in my article, if that's possible. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And I, have to, I should probably just uh, also let you know, like, I think you, your questions were really good. Like, it seemed like you understood the, the concept of, of the BISC DAO and what it's, what it's out to achieve, which is a lot different from a lot of other journalists from some uh, bigger publications. Uh, it, it was encouraging, I guess.
Well, good thank questions you. are always nice to answer, but not so good questions are a bit annoying. <laughs> I, I appreciate it, man. Um, I'm I'm a Bitcoiner and I like Bisc. I use Bisc, so um, I think that might have helped helped me understand it a little bit. How about you? Were, were you like? Um, I mean, I certainly was. Were you like a little? Um, what was your first impression of the DAO? When I first heard about it. When you first heard about it. When I first heard about it, I was like you said. I was one of those Bitcoin maximalists that was like, ah, oh, DAO. Ah. And then I started reading about it. Yeah. <laughs> and I actually saw, I think it might have been on World Crypto Network. I saw an interview with Manfred Carrer where he was talking yeah. about the DAO and explaining like, hey, look, we have to use this token to do what we're trying to do. And like he, he made a good case for it. And um, it made me more open minded towards the token and stuff, because I was one of those people that was like, oh, a token, no, nah, it's going to be a scam. But um, now, right. that I, now that I've learned about it, I, I really think that this might actually be the first altcoin, like not a shit coin, but an actual alternative coin. Yeah, well, I mean, kudos to you, because I mean, even people who, who who come across these articles and videos, like a lot of, I, I don't know, I, feel, I, I, I mean, I lean toward maximalism myself, but I think a lot of people in the, in the, in the space just kind of, they become, in a sense, almost intolerant, like the word just completely pushes them away. And even these, these resources that we've put out, they just, I mean, I've seen some of them just completely ignore them. Um, so I, I appreciate that you took the time to open your mind a little bit and check out, check it out. Yeah. And like, like I said, I just recently, like I heard about it a few months back and I started getting yeah. curious, like, Hey, I wonder what's going on with that. So I just started Googling it and I was surprised that it's like almost ready to launch and stuff. And that's what actually made me want to get involved because I was like, Oh wow. Like this is awesome. So, um, i come full circle, yeah. I guess. Um, I wanted to say thank you also because I know we were, I know you're busy today and, and you took time to do the interview. So I really appreciate that. Oh, no problem. Uh, it's fine. Actually, I wanted to ask you, are you, so I think I've had issues with this. Are, what time is it in your time zone right now? It's 1145 AM, but I'm in uh, uh, South America. I'm in Colombia. So I'm like, I was on Eastern time. And I think like right now I'm like Midwestern time. Like it switched when you guys did daylight. Yeah, that's what it is. That's why. Yeah, I, that's what I, I was freaking out because I was like, wait, it's 11 o'clock. What's going on? But I think I, I realized later on that it's probably the, the, the daylight savings time. I'm an yeah, hour ahead of you right it's now. That we don't I switch. <laughs> we, we stay the same. You guys switch. And I, I think it just it just happened like like in the last couple of weeks, right? Yeah, it happened, I think, not this past weekend, but the weekend before. Um, that's, okay. Yeah, throwing things off a little bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I'll let you get yeah. back to uh, back to your busy schedule. But like I said, I appreciate you doing the interview. Uh, I'm going to write an article about it, and I'll send you a copy of the article. Sounds excellent. Appreciate it, Matt, uh, Ricardo. Yeah. Have a good day, Steve. All right. You too. Take care. Bye.